right, 535, we'll get going. <clears throat> For uh, those of you who may not know me, uh, Ian Grant, I'm the Executive Director of the Entrepreneurship Center, uh, joined by Heather McNeil, who you've probably heard from more than me, uh, Senior Program Manager of the Center. So welcome tonight. Um, always one of the high points of our semester as our um, E-Center Startup um, Speaker Series. Uh, tonight, we have two just absolutely amazing speakers and, and very different paths, very different journeys, which I always love to see that mashup. Um, and so it should be really exciting for you all. Uh, just a couple of housekeeping uh, aspects, uh, upcoming events. Uh, so in not this coming weekend, but the weekend after, um, the eCenter has partnered with the Interoperability Lab uh, for an Ideathon hackathon. Uh, so please uh, sign up for that if you want. You don't need a team. Uh, you can join and be put on a team. The focus is New Hampshire issues. Um, is it related to COVID? I forget, Heather, but. Uh, not specifically COVID. Um, I don't think we're releasing the problem statement just yet, um, but it's definitely okay. topical. Okay, topical and this is for New Hampshire. So uh, mm -hmm. think about that. Uh, and then for those of you who are first year students, will be sophomores next year. Uh, hopefully you've seen some information about this, but we have a new exciting program called the Shaw Innovation Explorers. Uh, so thanks to the sponsorship of an alum, uh, David Shaw, who founded IDEX uh, up in Portland. Uh, this is a program very hands-on, uh, really focused on a wide range of innovation, uh, primarily through field trips, uh, as well as a speaker series and, a, and a, several other aspects. Uh, and also each student gets a $5,000 scholarship. So that would be very selective process, 10 students. Uh, tomorrow is the first information session on that. The deadline is April 1st, so you have some more time. So for both of these, just feel free to go to the eCenter website. Uh, it's all on the homepage under our signature programs to learn more. Um, as always with these events, uh, it's, it's an I2 Passport event. So uh, later on uh, towards the end, because again, we ask for participation throughout the event, uh, Heather or I or in the chat will ask for you to put in your uh, username, email username. Um, and again, thanks to um, Hayden Sports, we'll have a raffle for two $15 gift certificates. Uh, and then everyone who participates throughout the entire uh, event uh, in the next week will we'll get a gift certificate uh, to Hop and Grind uh, in lieu of sort of dinner, a virtual dinner. So enough of the housekeeping. Um, both, uh, so we're gonna do, this is a different format. So we're gonna do back-to-back -back presentations as opposed to a panel. Uh, so Jerome is gonna uh, go first, Jerome Dubois. Um, I can literally spend the entire session going through their bios. So I'm gonna do a very condensed version uh, of their very impressive bios uh, and let them really sort of talk about what they did post UNH uh, and the journey they were on. So Jerome's class of 96 um, from SEPS, got his uh, MBA from Northeastern. Um, currently co-founder, co-CEO of Six River Systems, which I think is in Waltham, but it's in, it's in Massachusetts. Um, and prior to that, had, I uh, was part of the leadership system, leadership team of Kiva Systems uh, that was acquired by Amazon. And I think probably one of the first big acquisitions by Amazon of a East Coast company. Um, and then he went on to work for Amazon as uh, leading business development initiatives uh, as well. So wide range of experience. Uh, so he's going to go first. We'll have some Q&A afterwards, and then we'll switch over to uh, Toby, and I'll talk about Toby's bio uh, then. So uh, with that, uh, Jerome, thanks for being here and look forward to your comments. Great. Thanks, Ian. Thanks, uh, everyone, for uh, having me here. Um, while I'm loading up the <clears throat> presentation, funny story, I started off my career at, at what the time was at the Whittemore School of Business uh, at my uh, studies at UNH and nearly failed out after my first year. So decided to thought the smart thing to do was to transfer over to SEPS afterwards uh, as a mechanical engineering undergrad. So um, kind of a strange journey to get into engineering, but that was kind of how things started. Um, let me pull up the presentation here. All right, present. If I can get a thumbs up, if everybody can see that, all right. Perfect. Thank you. All right. Whoops. There we go. So, a uh, very quick background. Um, 
started my career. So I've been in supply chain since pretty much I was 15 years old. Uh, I was the son of a CEO that ran a manufacturing company in Connecticut. And I spent my spring and summer breaks uh, working uh, free labor for the company. And my earliest supply chain jobs were uh, counting inventory in the parts bins and updating old green screen computers uh, with the inventories of those different parts. So that's kind of how I started my supply chain career. Um, the, the story here is that, uh, you know, I've been through a lot of startups and a lot of smaller companies. Um, in every single case, these companies uh, ended up being successfully being acquired by much larger companies. So in the case of uh, Yantra in 98, where I started my professional career after my MBA, that was acquired by what is now part of IBM. Um, and in, for Kiva back in 2008, uh, which was really the grandfather of robotics and warehousing, um, that's where that real industry kind of built out. That was acquired by Amazon in 2014, sorry, in 2014, uh, 2012, sorry, 2012. Um, so it was acquired in, in 2012. And then now with Six River, we started the company in 2015 and we were acquired in 2019 by Shopify. So, um, you know, when you think about entrepreneurship and you think about the stories uh, of success, um, you know, you think about, you know, hey, I'm going to go public, I'm going to IPO, especially now in the world of SPACs and all this wonderful traction that everybody thinks that they're going to make a gazillion dollars going public. A lot of this is actually through acquisition, the vast majority of companies that start up get acquired at some point. Um, and that's actually not necessarily a bad thing. Uh, you know, you can learn quite a bit from a lot of these large companies uh, that are out there. So uh, just something to kind of think about when you're looking at your careers. Um, so the, the reason why Six River was started, the company, uh, Ian is, is correct, is based in Waltham, Massachusetts. Most of you, probably all of you at this point, order and buy much more online than you do in retail stores. Um, and um, that actually has created a huge gap in the, um, the space and an opportunity. Uh, what has occurred effectively is that smaller orders require more work to do to get out the door. Um, and it increases the amount of labor that's required to fulfill those orders out of warehouses. The orders that you place online go to these big buildings called warehouses. And somebody has to run around and grab the items, you know, the the red lipstick and the blue shirt and put it in a box and ship it to your door. Um, that's a lot less efficient than picking a whole case of red lipstick and a whole case of blue shirts and putting it to a store. So a lot more labor is required to go pick those items on your behalf and ship them to your door, which creates a massive demand for labor. Um, and on the flip side of that, that massive demand of labor, the challenge is that the supply of labor isn't there. People don't go to UNH to go work in a warehouse as an hourly associate. That's not what you're there for. Like that you're studying to be the manager or to be some executive or start your own business. Very few people are aspiring to be warehouse associates, um, which is um, sad in a way because they're actually very high paying jobs. The hourly associate right now in a warehouse gets paid somewhere between 24 and 25, like 20 to $25 an hour. Just back in two, like 10 years ago, if you rewind just 10 years, that same person was making eight to $9 an hour. So this is a massive escalation in cost of labor to do the work. So the use of technology is used to increase the productivity of those operators, the people in the warehouse and make the job easier for people to do, which attracts new labor into the, 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 the industry. The technology itself has gotten a lot more reliable um, it's a lot more available and a lot less expo expensive because of things like cloud-based computing and open source software and um, you know, uh, battery technology really driven off of the autonomous vehicle movement. All of you are probably familiar with autonomous vehicles. A lot of sensor technology, battery technology being developed by that industry is bleeding down to lower cost level. And effectively a robot like ours, what's called an autonomous mobile robot is an autonomous vehicle. It, it travels on its own without any uh, guidance. Um, and lastly, if you think about the competition, when we looked at what was out there, the competition was very established and slow moving. Um, it was not market driven. It kind of built a product and said, this is the product you're all going to use. It didn't think about the user. Um, in addition to that, the investment in robotics was accelerating. Um, and in fact, as a sign of that, just in the last month, 
two companies in the Massachusetts ecosystem, the Boston ecosystem, both announced valuations over a billion dollars when they raised money. A company called Berkshire Gray just announced that they were going public at $2.7 billion valuation. And uh, our nearest competitor, Locust, just announced a raise of $150 million on a billion dollar valuation, making them an official unicorn at this point. So there's massive amount of money going into uh, the industry um, and uh, when we looked at it back in 2015, this was happening, starting to happen, but we saw that very few people really understood what needed to be built out. The chart on the right-hand side that you see there is the fact that COVID has accelerated all these things. You, you effectively, that spike on the right-hand side represents an acceleration of e-commerce adoption. Within six months, it actually outpaced everything that happened to it within the first, like in the previous 10 years. So we've essentially accelerated from 2020 to 2030 in six months, which is an amazing underpinning of demand and kind of swell uh, for uh, what we're trying to do here at Six River Systems and really created an opportunity for us to continue to grow uh, at a pretty significant pace. For now, that's the business opportunity. The personal opportunity, um, you know, I had kind of seen a lot of different technologies and worked for some pretty amazing people. Um, but when I started the company in 2015, I was, you know, just over 40 years old. So I was old enough to have the scars and the experience of being through a few startups and seeing things go well and not so well. But I still had the energy and the youth to kind of go and get up and do it again, right? I got knocked off the horse and you have to get up and do it again. And that's really the startup and entrepreneur mentality that you have to have. Um, at every step of the way, you need to take an opportunity to build relationships. And the three circles that you see here represent the three most kind of influential, some of the three most influential people in my life in terms of, uh, you know, the, the professional CEOs that I was working for. Um, and all of them were just absolutely, uh, you know, uh, strong influences for me. And I, I took time to develop relationships with them. Um, of course, you know, that started, of course, with, you know, having a relationship with my dad to begin with, who was also an influential CEO. Uh, the white space opportunity um, when I took a step back, we saw an opportunity to merge these different technologies together and create something called Six River Systems. So there was definitely white space. And I got to learn from these different people in different companies and apply that knowledge into Six River. And lastly, uh, I learned from a, a young age that if you believe in yourself, you have to bet on yourself. And ultimately, that's the heart and soul of an entrepreneur, that you have to have confidence in knowing that you can deliver something. You have to have that confidence through experience or just innateness that you're going to go make that big bet on yourself. And that's really where it becomes a challenge. It becomes very personal at that point as to whether or not how confident you are in your abilities. But you know that if you're going to get knocked down, you're going to get right back up. So um, just uh, what I thought would be fun to take a history of this last experience in Six Rivers, the last five years through pictures and talk through kind of six lessons learned in the five and a half years of Six River. Uh, and they apply both to your personal life and to your startup life. So the first lesson is to stay scrappy. So this is a, a, a it stays, stay scrappy as, as it will serve you later on is kind of the subtitle. This is a picture of us, uh, some of us in our very, very scrappy offices. Uh, I'm sure Toby could relate to, you know, starting small and kind of doing anything you can to get a small space and you've got a little bit of money and you don't know how to pay people. But we spent a lot of time, you know, eating late uh, and working late. And, um, you know, really what it did was it allowed to build a community, a strong bond uh, with the original engineers that we hired on and that stays today. Um, it wasn't very flattering, uh, but it was really that bond that continues to drive the innovation in the company today. Um, we knew we had some hard problems to solve uh, and, you know, we had to work the late nights and, and you know, lack, lack of sleep to get there. Uh, but incredibly important to stay scrappy and to remember your roots, right? A little bit later on, this is just a few months later, uh, about seven, eight months later, we actually had a working prototype. We were um, working with some early partners. And this lesson is to choose your early partners carefully. So lesson number one, stay scrappy. The second one is choose your early partners carefully as they will have a massive impact on your roadmap and product direction. Your earliest customers, your earliest partners will influence your direction much more than any others after. And, you know, we had pretty amazing partners that allowed us to do some pretty crazy things with some ideas late at night in a warehouse. Um, and it was wonderful to have that relationship and to, to have that opportunity to build that relationship with them. 
Uh, we got to test our system out late at night. We got to work with associates. It wasn't going to work very well, but they were willing to try it out. Um, and finding those early partners was incredibly important to do that. Um, and, uh, you know, I think it led to a lot of our successes and accelerated our successes afterwards. So choose your early partners carefully. Uh, again, about four or five months later, um, you know, we, we learned some really hard lessons. We thought we had figured out a few things. We were feeling pretty good about our solution. Here, we're about a size of about 14 uh, people in the company with one product. This robot uh, that you see here is a picture of, we call our robots generically Chuck, but they're all personalized with license plate. Uh, this one is actually named after my son. And I can assure you that the resemblance is far more than just the license plate. They're, this, this robot was getting itself in trouble and my son has quite the ability to get himself in trouble as well. Um, we learned a lot. Uh, so the lesson here is to shut up and listen. Um, it won't always go right, but so you have to stay humble. And we were feeling pretty confident, like I said, but we started making some mistakes. We, we thought we had things figured out, but it turned out that we really didn't. The product wasn't quite there. So again, you, know, you just have to shut up and listen and kind of hear the feedback. It may be painful, but you need to hear that feedback and grow from that feedback. All right. When we started uh, in the later half of 2017, uh, we were far more uh, established in terms of we actually had a couple of customers and we had a team of about 35 people. Um, but in this case, the lesson, the lesson was around focus. Um, you know, this doesn't look like a very glamorous site, but it actually represents a huge step up from where we were. We actually had 40 robots running around in this building picking e-commerce orders for Disney. So if you ordered something from Disney.com, a t-shirt or something like that, it's likely being picked out of this facility, either in Memphis or one in California and being shipped to your house. Um, but the biggest deployment we had done to, the, to date prior to that was eight robots. We went from eight to 40 robots in Memphis, Tennessee. And it was just an absolute, like just a, a mind bending experience to try to get this to work. And we just sat down and we focused. We just focused on solving one problem incredibly well. We knew we had to solve that one problem before we earned the right to go and, and ask the customer for the next thing and the next thing and the next thing. Um, and you know, in this case, that focus allowed us to then build the trust with the, the customer and allowed us to then go in and develop more products and to, to, to fill out our portfolio of products. But we knew we had to solve that one problem very, very well. Um, so the slide that we see here is the exact same site, but just a, about nine months later, it was certainly cleaned up, uh, much more professional. Today, this is one of the best performing sites for this customer. Um, they absolutely love the system. They've been running it for, you know, coming up on three years now. Uh, and it's core to, to their strategy in the warehouse and how they fulfill orders uh, for their customers and e-commerce orders. So. Now, um, when you are done focusing and you solve a problem and you're feeling pretty confident that you've got that pretty well under wraps, you start to st think about what you're going to do next. And I think the big, uh, the big lesson here is to know when to make your bets um, or your next bet. Know when to make that bet because it helps to have the muscles before building new ones. We had the confidence that we had a product that worked really, really well. So once we had that baseline, we said, OK, fine. We've got a good track record here. Let's go leverage that and build out um, these new products. And here. This, uh, what you see in front of you, it's called a sort wall. So uh, I'm not sure if any of you have ever been in a warehouse before, but effectively what happens is rather than picking out the red lipstick and the blue shirt 20 times over an hour for 20 different orders, you group those all together and you pick them once, you go to the location once for the 20 red lipsticks and once for the 20 blue t-shirts, you batch them together and then you have to find a way of sorting them out and into the individual orders because we don't want Heather to get Tobias's or Toby's order and we don't want Ian to get Riley's order, right? So we have to separate these things out. And that's what this is. It's called a sortation center or mobile sort or sort wall. And it's a product that we developed back in 2018 um, and we, and sorry, uh, 2019. And we did this knowing that we had the core product, our picking product with the robot well underway and solid. So we, this took a massive amount of effort. Effectively, it took two thirds of our engineering resources, 
almost an entire year to build out this capability. And it was a huge bet for us. But we knew that if we didn't advance the product, if we didn't advance our footprint, that we would be left behind because the competition was pretty fierce. Um, so we kicked off the project in late 2018. It was one of the last designs that I did for the company. Uh, and then we ended up selling uh, that, that product. The first customer went live in 2019. We've subsequently sold about a half dozen times since then, but really pushed us into uh, a new direction. So know when to bet is the life here. This is, is the lesson here around now that you've got the focus and the core product, know when to bet on the next one is, is important. Um, this also was true when we kicked off our advanced program. So now advancing the technology and product even further, um, you know, integrating in ARM technology to pick items and place them into the robot, um, further improving the productivity of the warehouses. Um, this, this has actually been a, a big hit for us as well. Um, and again, it's, it's about building those muscles, building that new, what we call new product introduction muscles and knowing that we've got that solid core to build off of before we launched new products. Another example of a new product is um, what we call our auto loaders. So this is actually a way of uh, these boxes and totes have to be placed on the robots before they go out to start picking with people in the warehouse. Um, so this is a way of automating that process. Um, so as you can see here, there's some mechanics involved in terms of loading and unloading these things. And again, part of the innovation muscle that we started developing uh, at Six River in 2018, 19, and, and, and putting out in 2020. And of course, last year, um, you know, we developed a brand new robot that we put out in the market in 2020. Um, and this is what we call our latest edition of Chuck, super configurable, it represents everything we know about robotics and working with robots and warehouses for what we're trying to do. And this was a massive effort. This was probably about two years of work for roughly 40 engineers uh, between the hardware and the software and the system design and everything else. So very significant effort for our company and has been a, a, a very uh, strong success for us as we move into new markets and as we go into Europe and a few other places. The last uh, lesson, there'll be uh, some uh, summary of this is to take a lot of pictures. Um, so fortunate to have experienced uh, an amazing journey with uh, Six River and, you know, everybody that's worked for the company, we consider family. Um, you know, it's very important to us to continue that tradition. Today, we have over 250 employees um, and uh, I still take time every single week. I have a one-on-one -on -one with a new hire that we bring on board. So 45 minutes, we call them our donut sessions and they're randomly chosen. And we just meet with a new employee or somebody who's been with the company for 45 minutes, just sit down. It's one of my favorite parts of my job is to get to know these folks in a different environment, different context, and they have direct access to me anytime they want. So that's pretty exciting. Um, but taking a lot of pictures is important. Uh, these memories will stay with you forever. And it's great to go back and and, and relive them so you don't forget about them because it kind of really keeps you energized and it keeps the core, again, that, that company feel, that family feel together, which is so important, especially with times like today where everybody's working remotely, you don't get to see each other in the office nearly as much as you used to. So keeping that community feel uh, is, is incredibly important. So as a result of all our hard work, um, you know, this is an example of our growth that we've seen in 2016. We had one customer and one site. Um, by the end of last year, we were near approaching 50 customers and over 80 warehouses worldwide using our technology. Um, this year, we will eclipse the, the, we'll be closer to 60 customers or so and well over 100 warehouses, getting close to 125 warehouses worldwide using our technology in Europe and Canada, United States. It defines us as, it, it, according to everybody else, they call us the industry leader. Uh, in this space that we uh, work in, um, but we're incredibly fortunate and lucky to have, uh, you know, this result. And really the, the acquisition by Shopify, which is a company that some of you may have heard of, was really something that was uh, quite fortunate for us. Um, it happened in October of 2019, just a few months before COVID hit and really uh, put a lot of concern into the hearts of our customers and our investors. 
Um, we would have been in a very different situation had we not been acquired by Shopify in the terms of having to go out and compete for money and raise money, um, not knowing what a future would look like. Now, it turns out that we happen to be in a very good industry um, and this industry has seen stratospheric growth um, over the last 12 months because as I shared with you, the amount of demand for e-commerce, uh, but um, you know, we continue to grow and that core team that we keep talking about is hiring and recruiting and developing. And again, the, the employee count will go from somewhere between 250 people to about 350 people by the end of the year. So, so uh, the learnings here as I wrap up, the good, the bad, and the ugly as we talk about. Again, these lessons I believe apply in life as they do uh, in your startup and your entrepreneur uh, career. The number one uh, lesson there was to stay scrappy. Uh, it will serve you well in the long run. I think, you know, at UNH and I think in, in New England, we have a, uh, a characteristic, right, of Yankee ingenuity and kind of building it on our own and being scrappy about things. Choose your partners carefully. I think that's incredibly important in life as well, uh, not just in business. Shut up and listen is something that uh, takes a little bit more time and maturity sometimes to develop, but I think it's a very important lesson to listen to the feedback, uh, as painful as it may be. Uh, stay focused. Uh, stay focused till you hit your goal and accomplish something that's real and tangible. And then use that strength and that confidence to know when to make your next next bets, right? So don't try to sprint too quickly. You gotta you, you have to sprint in one direction, but don't try to cover the bases everywhere. Okay. You really need to stay focused, achieve that one thing, and then go on to the next thing. Uh, and of course, take a lot of pictures so you can remember the path along the way. So. And there you go, Ian, that's the, the presentation. There. Jerome, thanks, wow, what a, that's an amazing journey. <laughs> um, <clears throat> thank you for sharing that. Um, <clears throat> so if anybody has any questions, just throw them in chat and, and, and while we're doing that. Um, so it's actually an interesting start to say that you started off at the business school and failed, right, in, in some ways, and then reinvented yourself and, and, and went over to SEPs and, and, and that journey. So, you know, that's a pretty big life lesson early. And, and obviously, you know, we all hear that failure is, is sometimes more impactful than successes. Um, can you talk a little bit more about like how that sort of got embedded in your DNA? And then, and then part two of that is that you, you know, you're the son of a successful CEO and, and how did he handle that? So um, I think that uh, the, truthfully, the, the direction to go from business to engineering was heavily influenced by, by home for sure. But I think the realization is that the engineering mindset is one that helps you solve problems. Um, it doesn't matter what discipline in engineering you learn. I think it's just the approach of, what are my knowns? What are my unknowns? What are my guiding equations? Solve. And I think that applies in business as well as it does in engineering and science, right? So I think that that was one thing. The other thing too, is that um, it's through that experience that I learned how resilient that you can actually be. Um, I was not a natural engineer by any stretch of the imagination. So it forced me to kind of think differently. Um, and I think it challenges you as an individual and pushes you uh, in, in ways that, you know, you may have to find uh, other ways of doing that if you were to study other disciplines. I'm not saying that one's more academically challenging. Well, one may be more academically challenging than the other, but they're, they're challenging in different ways. And I think that it's really up to the end of, in this case, for me personally, the challenge of learning a, a uh, uh, engineering pushed me and my boundaries and, and put made me uncomfortable. And I had to kind of overcome that. And that was something that was incredibly important as we developed, you know, as I, as I started my career in small businesses and you always had to push forward, you always had to put, you had to be okay with uncomfortable and just keep focusing and moving forward. So. Great. Uh, so question from Caitlin, uh, a couple questions. Um, what allowed you to decipher between positive and negative feedback with using the shut up and listen technique? That's a great question. Um, so I think, you know, frankly, when it comes from customers, almost all feedback is good. Like it's not positive or negative. It's just like good or, or like, you know, not worth the paper it's written on. But I think you have to listen to that customer perspective and you have to understand if, if ultimately you're trying to service somebody, like if you're building a product or a service, the person you're trying to service, if they are telling you it's not working for them, you have to understand why. 
right? And those data, you have to just keep collecting those data points. Um, now, how much of it you internalize personally or how much you internalize it into your product is up to you, but it's still important to collect that data. I think, you know, in our case, we had a very clear mindset as to what we wanted to go do. Um, so I, I think we looked at it and said, hey, for this problem, if the feedback applies to this problem, great. So as an example, if the customer said, hey, we want your robot to go deliver something out in the parking lot, like that's not the problem we're trying to solve. It's very important feedback. I appreciate that, but that's not the problem we're trying to solve here. In the problem we're trying to solve, you know, do you have the, the feedback for us, et cetera? So. Great. So um, if I didn't misunderstand it, it sounds like your journey included working at a number of startups and then sort of building your toolbox and then jumping off and doing it yourself. So, so that's one path for sure. And, and probably the most traditional path, but there are some that are on this call that are in the middle of it now, right? So as undergrads that are, yep. they're working on their idea, they're launching, they're, they're doing customer discovery, they're starting that whole process. Um, what, what would you share with them for, you know, doing that right out as an undergrad or, or even a recent grad? I think it's a, it's a, a noble thing to do it right as an undergrad um, or, or just, you know, with minimal work experience. I think some of the best ideas come directly from, I mean, if you look at the great innovations of the world, I mean, they may be dated at this point, but a lot of people did not finish college and went on to be incredibly successful CEOs and, and you know, by all rights are brilliant people, right? So, um, but, so I think there's a passion and energy, which is amazing there, right? And a great idea, one of the things that we say at Six River, the great idea doesn't come from the top, right? Like it comes from anywhere. You just have to listen. And that's part of that shut up and listen too, is like, you know, when you're in a room with 10 other colleagues, or if you're on a, a Zoom call or something like that with 10, 15, 20 other people, you have to listen because the great idea is in that room somewhere. And you have to find the way to encourage that. So all of you are capable of coming up with a great idea, right? It's just whether or not you have the ability to go execute it. Now that's a different story, right? And the execution portion of that I think depends a lot more on experience because you don't want to fall in the same trap as everybody else has, you know, the last two generations, right? You don't want to make the same mistake. If you can avoid making that mistake and be more efficient with the capital that you're raising, then I think it's a really good idea to bring on some senior people to advise you along the way. The idea is all yours, but the execution of how you bring that to market, I think is best, it's best to consult with somebody who's had some experience doing that. And just picking up on something you just said, um, what's what's your technique for? So obviously there's some people in the room that are type A and 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 bigger voices, and and some are uh, quieter, maybe a little bit more introverted. But ideas sometimes are better in my experience. What's what's your technique to to make sure that the quieter uh, voice is heard in that process? So we are. It's a great question. Um, we are. I would not say struggling, but that is a challenge that the company has today because as we started out, we were mostly type A's and now we're hiring a very diverse group of folks. It turns out that we are adapting our meeting techniques now to actually appeal to true introverts that have a very hard time either being on camera or on the phone and having these conversations. By the way, Six River operates at what we call digital by default. We are 100% remote 100% of the time almost. Um, there's very few people that actually go into an office. There's less than 20 people that go in the office on any given day. So we are absolutely working through this whole transition from physical proximity to each other to now distance. And we've learned that some people interact differently and are less comfortable on camera than others. Uh, so what we've done now is we've started to prepare documents ahead of time. We'll share the agenda, we'll share questions, we'll share materials ahead of time, which allows people that are more introverted to review the material and prepare and feel more confident during the meeting to ask those questions or get their questions answered. So that's something that we've had to do, yeah. That's great. A uh, couple of questions here from uh, Patrick. How do you stay focused on one project at a time and not jump too quickly? Uh, it's <laughs> So that is an interesting one. Um, the nature of an engineer is to want to go solve problems. Uh, so, you know, we kind of look at it and say, you know, uh, have we developed enough, 
have we generated enough value either internally or externally to be able to walk away from this and say, we've gotten as far as we're going to get with it before we move on to the next thing? Um, if the answer is no, then we're going to keep working at it. Now, sometimes you have to go and make a decision and say, we're never going to solve this problem. So it's probably not worth going to do, you know, spending all the energy to do it. But it is, that is an interesting question to ask. Um, the other challenge that you have to balance that with, by the way, is your investors are going to look for progress and growth. And it can't take, you know, an obscene amount of time to show that because uh, they're going to see these different hurdles. Um, so you need to be able to kind of demonstrate sufficient growth in the products to build and develop. Actually, one, one way to do this is by establishing milestones that say it may not be number of customers, but it's, you know, number of hours that this system ran without crashing or how reliable is it? How many units have you picked? In our case, how many units have we helped process the customer process? How what percentage of their orders are actually flowing through our system? Right. These are the different metrics that you can use to demonstrate progress to investors and others and engineers and establish milestones before you say, OK, fine, we're going to say we want 25 percent of the orders to flow through the system. Once we've achieved that, we can go on to the next thing. So. Great. Um, another question is the uh, how difficult was the transition from Kiva and, and Amazon by default to Six River? That's the first question. Yes. Uh, super easy there, I think. The, I've been in supply chain technology my entire career. So this was just a continuation of that. I think the beauty of the transition was that we knew at Six River that we had a product that applied to more people than it did at Kiva. So it was, we were super excited about the opportunity because we could go sell this to more people. We could like change people's lives in more places, um, which was really appealing for us. From an organization perspective, I joined Kiva, it was, you know, they had, four or five customers, roughly about 100 people a company. When I left, it was like 500, 600 people after Amazon acquired it. Um, it had become very Amazonian. I worked for Amazon corporate for a little while, for about a year and a half. Um, we lear I learned a lot of lessons there. A lot of things that I learned made its way into Six River, not from a product perspective, but just how to grow a business, how to scale a business. Um, so that transition was, was quite comfortable. And then in the, did you have to build, oh, so you had some knowledge in robotics. Did you have to start from the ground up or was it like a re-engineering of what you done at Kiva? Like what was that, yeah. was that transition and the focus difference between the two? From a product perspective, it was night and day. We, we took, it was a, it's a very different approach. We're trying to solve, we're trying to solve the same problem in a different way. Um, the way we describe it is that like Kiva was like the Ferrari of whatever it was, right? It was like the top, the best, the absolute gold standard. We were trying to help people upgrade from a 20 year old Honda Civic to like a Mustang. That's what we were trying to do. We were not trying to get them from the 20 year old Civic to a Ferrari. That's the Kiva. So for us, it was about building a product that was uh, more accessible. And our, and our goal was really to democratize fulfillment, to democratize automation for everybody, to make it accessible to everybody. So the solution that I used to sell a Kiva for $5 million is now roughly $500,000. And that's how you disrupt the market, right? What took 18 months to go deploy takes 18 days to go deploy, right? So you can disrupt the market by bringing this automation down and really providing a solution that more people can use. And, that, and that's how we started the product. We said, let's just make this something that everybody can use. So, so in, in 2019, and again, you touched on this, but you made a decision to be acquired, were, were you, did, did Shopify approach you or were you looking for an acquisition? That's part one. And then part two is, you know, even in 2019, the economy was still was booming. There were unicorns and a fair amount of money in the market. So, so if you do that, you can talk about sort of that decision-making and, and why not go public and, and, and then the acquisition yeah. by Shopify. So um, I think, so we were to go backwards. Um, we were actually raising our next round of investment. So we were in the middle of our Series C financing round um, and had locked in a lead investor uh, at a very nice valuation. And we were looking to kind of fill out what's called filling out the round. So you have a lead investor that sets the price and then you have other investors like our existing investors were all asking to go buy more equity to buy more at that price. But we wanted to make room for a new strategic investor to fill out the round. And that's when we started talking to companies I got introduced to Shopify through a mutual friend. And within two weeks, we had the CEO of Shopify in our office, in our very humble offices in Waltham, 
So it moved incredibly fast. Now, Toby Lutke is like a superhuman. Like he is an amazing person. If you, if you follow him on Twitter or whatever, he's just this amazing human, thinks about things on a completely different level than most of us do. And to have him in our offices, to have that conversation, I said, okay, this is no longer an investment. Clearly there's something else happening here. And um, we were not looking to sell ourselves. We were simply trying to raise money to go kind of continue the dream. But the dreams were so aligned. What he wanted and what we wanted were so mutually aligned that this was like the perfect marriage. We, he told us flat out, I want you to do exactly what you're doing, but do it faster and I will give you whatever access to the capital you need to go do it. And that was like, and oh, by the way, we're gonna run you completely independently. I said, okay, hold on. This is a little bit too good to be true, but it turns out that's exactly what they want to do. That's the Shopify way. We're a completely independent organization within Shopify. We report up our financials and that's it. The day-to-day -day is still being managed by, you know, Ryland Hamilton and I as co-CEOs. And that will continue to be as such as we continue to grow and hit our numbers and, and you know, meet, meet our metrics. But, but I think that's, it's, it's an amazing outcome for us. I mean, storybook kind of stuff, right? Fairy tale stuff. For sure. Sure. Um, anyone else have a question? I have one more wrap up question, but we have a couple minutes left. So just put it in chat if anybody does. And while you're typing that, um, so not an original question, I'm, I'm taking it from Guy Raz and how'd you build that? So um, skill or luck? <laughs> um, have you ever ha heard him ask those questions on how'd you build yeah. that? So uh, again, somebody who had a very strong influence on me early on is that you make your own luck. Um, so you kind of have to put yourself in position to do it. Uh, the good news is that I, I had, uh, through a lot of <laughs> blood, sweat and tears built up a lot of experience, um, working really, really hard for a really long time. Uh, so I had some skills. I'm not saying I was the most skilled, but I had certainly some skills and the knowledge in the space. So we were able to move very, very quickly. We just happened to be, a lot of it is luck. You have to, but you have to put yourself there. I mean, the fact that Shopify acquired us. Nobody could have seen that coming, but if you look at the results, you know, Shopify stock has increased 4X since the acquisition. They are seen as, you know, the next challenger to Amazon. Um, we're perfectly well positioned within the industry to do that. I think we have the right technology at the right time. So it really is kind of a combination of those two things. Yeah. Fantastic. Well, thank you very much. Appreciate it. A great, great presentation. I personally have like another thousand questions, but we'll do that some other time. Well, I'm looking forward to Toby's presentation. Thank you very much for yeah, having me. Yeah, for sure. <clears throat> well, thank you. Uh, thank you, everybody. Um, so now we're going to uh, shift gears uh, halfway across the country. Uh, Toby's in Denver, Colorado. Um, he's uh, class of 01. Uh, and we're going to probably the CEO of Averiskin, Averskin. There. But there, so I had it right, uh, which is a, a cannabis uh, driven skincare firm. Uh, prior to that, he co founded Colorado's first wholesale cultivation and current marketing of a luxury flower purveyor since 2014 called Veritas Fun Cannabis. Um, and so, uh, and he had a super long um, uh, bio as well. But, but the more important part is, Toby, for you to <clears throat> share your multiple stories and, and, and talk about it. And I think you're going to talk about some of the creative uh, marketing and sales that you've been able to do. So, I'll turn it over to you to chat about that. Thank you. Thank you, and thank you for y'all for showing up. And Jerome, that was a tough act to follow, uh, but I, I did learn one thing: we warehouse business, yeah. uh, very, very different sides of it. But um, I guess uh, Ian asked me to tell a bit of a bio story of how I got here. Um, graduated UNH in '01. I was a ski racer um, from uh, Ketchum, Idaho, uh, where the Sun Valley Resort is. So I'm I'm a Westerner by uh, youth and whatnot. So I. Uh, it's not a, not a New England story here, but I uh, do, do have a big love for New Hampshire and love getting back there. Uh, when I graduated, I wanted to be a, a high-tech investment banker in San Francisco. That didn't work out. Um, the tech bu boom or bust was occurring at graduation, rolled it into 9-11 uh, occurring a few months later, uh, completely just skunked on any uh, job opportunities, which was a uh, a fun new world, you know, your first job is going to be your hardest, I, I've always been told, and I think that's probably true. Um, I fell backwards into a real estate development position at that point. Uh, real estate didn't go away, even though finance and tech did uh, for the time being. Um, now everything is very much rosier in that world, but uh, 
I was in real estate for a very long time. Um, ended up work, uh, back in Sun Valley working for a small development company where we managed projects for uh, an old investment bank called Lehman Brothers, um, in addition to managing some um, proceeds of the, some of the executives there and into really fun development projects in uh, re resort, luxury golf type things, um, things around the Sun Valley area, a few other resort markets. Um, in 2008, in the financial crisis, um, Lehman Brothers went, went under. Um, the CEO liked what we were doing and had a home and a presence in Sun Valley. So he knew us, even though it was a 25,000 person company, knew us kind of intimately as to what we were doing, had invested in other projects that weren't related to his firm. Um, and we partnered up, uh, myself, my old boss, and the CEO of Lehman Brothers into a real estate private equity firm um, after the financial crisis. And I put together investment thesis and scouted acquisitions uh, to purchase uh, vacant land in the urban areas of the Intermountain West. We focused on the mountain time zone, raw land in some of the fastest growing areas in the country. And that was uh, an investment thesis I had put together through some macro data, uh, US Census stuff, Brookings Institute, um, a few other models of, of looking at these amazing areas that I had grown up um, as a ski racer going throughout the Mountain West and, and knowing and seeing the boom firsthand of towns that back then nobody had really focused on. Pandemic wise, they are all boom towns across the board, whether that's a Boise, Idaho, a Salt Lake City, Denver, Colorado, Fort Collins, um, even the ski towns um, do have interesting underlying investment fundamentals. So I had always been focused on kind of dislocated markets, if you will, and finding an opportunity as a smaller person in, in the huge real estate space. Um, I, I don't come from a lot of money. I am from a town where there's a lot of money. So I, I knew a few people I could call and be able to put things together just based on brain power and being different than the rest of the herd and the pack of chasing the really high dollar locations in the coastal cities um, where it's it's very saturated. Uh, it is lower risk. Um, it's not to say it's no risk, nothing is, but uh, the fundamentals of the mountain towns possessed something I really liked, that there was an earnestness, there was a, a, a macro tailwind of people moving to these areas because of low cost of doing business, uh, high quality of life, low cost of living, and it's just a very honest, fun, um, great way to kind of live the American dream, if you will, versus the cities. And, and we're, this is my first kind of pandemic speaking gig to a, a larger education center. So I'm a little, uh, some of the stuff doesn't go over, or it's it's more known now that, that we have this, this kind of fun place here that is... Uh, uh, quite the difference from a New York City or a San Francisco. Uh, in 2011, um, I started to get the itch that I wanted to go out on my own. Um, I didn't know what exactly that looked like. I didn't know if that was taking a, a larger partner seat in the world I was in or um, how to get from real estate into my own, my own world from out from the the Wall Street heavy hitters and whatnot, um, where I was just a, a number, even though I was a, one of three partners and whatnot. Um, the world that we had built in that space didn't evolve as fast as I wanted to. I was 32 at the time, and my partners were in their 50s, 60s, um, maybe even knocking on 70 years old. So we had just had differing kind of life circumstances, a lot like what Jerome said, the, the partners you pick early on will dictate um, a lot of uh, passively your, your path as well. Um, and I, I started to get the feel that this is something I could probably do on my own. Um, I was also living back in my home ski town, which is a town of 3,000 people. Um, the county is about 15,000 people. Um, so it, it kind of got that island fever, if you will, of my early 30s. It's now or never to get out and, and start something. And, and like Jerome said, you, you've got the scars to have lived through the financial crisis, lived through a year of unemployment after graduating UNH and not getting that first dream job at the venture capital firm in San Francisco and, and whatnot. But um, you, you've got the scars, but you've also got the tenacity to get back up there and, and you're, not, you're not done fighting. Um, I'm also still in that position that he mentioned. I'm 41 years old now and starting a new company. So I am uh, hopefully in that 
somewhere between my second and third act here of, uh, of br brushing myself up and getting up and, and fighting some more. Um, back to 2011, I kind of put in my notice at work and said, I don't know if this is working. I have a different pace I want to be going. The small town was um, a little claustrophobic. Um, a, a year went by of no more in action and uh, no more action. And we kind of made to a, a point of, it wasn't for me. I was kind of on my own to get a little pushed out of the nest. I had a small nest egg built up and I thought I could move to Denver and I could start, a, I could start my own real estate private equity company in Denver. Well, and we had a golf project here at the time. So there was some crossover. And one of the things I've learned in entrepreneurialism that you, is you want to do things one move away. You want a little crossover and that makes it a little easier rather than just going and jumping into a whole nother world, a whole nother swimming pool of problems, opportunities, Rolodex connections, everything, investors, everything you will need to be successful. You want a little overlap so people know, hey, he's got a little bit of it figured out and he's got enough to know that he maybe it's not he doesn't know what he doesn't know. Um, so moved to Denver. Um, unfortunately, three weeks after I moved to Denver, lost my father to colon cancer back home in Idaho and wasn't there. And that's a, one of those inflection points of life that you, you regret, but you, you need to make it worthwhile. Um, and you need to make it mean something in the, the hindsight of your story. We're all the heroes of our own story. And you know that, that success or that, vic that victory or that failure is at, it, at the end of the day, on your shoulders, win or lose. So, and that's something I adhere to through and through in, in the work and, and in life. Um, so I worked my ass off to try to get that real estate private equity company up and going in Denver. Denver was booming. It was t March of 2012 when I moved here. Um, yeah, so next year it'll be 10 years. Um, I was still a little gun shy on the real estate acquisition investment side from being so burned by the financial crisis and realizing how totally wrong something can go and completely out of your hands and you can still get left by the wayside and just blindsided by global calamity. Um, again, as we're in now to some extent and a lot of, there are a lot of winners and losers through this pandemic, but it, you know, we'll all hopefully get through it in one way or another and, and it's up to you what you do with it afterwards. So in the face of Denver booming, um, I had rounded up a few investors, but not to the size that I really needed to make a difference in Denver um, and really pull the trigger on an acquisition. There was, uh, the prices were racing upwards. There was a ton of risk, I thought, and the rewards were lower and lower. It was turning into one of the coastal cities that I had always used as a example of what I didn't wanna be investing because I didn't have a NYSE balance sheet or a several billion dollar fund behind me where you had some slough to make mistakes. I was living in a hand to mouth world and it was eat what you kill. And, and if, but if you miss on, on some of these, then you're left with nothing left with left to start over and knowing the, the faces of the investors I had and, and, and just that responsibility of not being able to take risks with their money and a, and a little bit of my own. Um, I, I sat it out for a year and a half. Um, started looking for jobs elsewhere, um, realized that the big city probably wasn't going to be for me and I needed to go to work for somebody else again to get my footing, to learn more about the city, to learn more about the opportunity and to shake off the, the rust from the financial crisis. Um, I had been taking some meetings in that entrepreneurial endeavor and, and looking for perhaps a job and a, a landing spot um, after I was exhausting my resources. And you take a lot of meetings as entrepreneurs. You, you try to learn as much as you can. I'm, I am a sponge of all sorts of information that some is useful, some is not. They have the noise and the signal, and it's up to you to figure out what the signal is and not the noise, but you still have to hear something. So I would take these meetings over and over again, and I started to see a pattern. People would ask me, as the little guy in town with no backing, no fund, no, no nothing, they would say, do you do cannabis? And I, I said, well, what, what do you mean cannabis? Do I, I'm, I'm here to talk about an office building. And they said, well, but, but cannabis real estate. And I, I would say, well, what do you mean? Like, like retail shops? I, I don't know. I don't know what you mean. And uh, I was never a big cannabis user. Um, I, I'm not, you know, not saying I, I didn't use it at all. I, I did, you know, a little bit, but not as much as some of my friends, family, colleagues, teammates, what have you. Um, 
so I, I um, had been taking these meetings about the cannabis real estate kept coming up and they said, because you're not a, a pub co on the stock exchange or you're not a, a fund um, like you had been before at, this, at your previous companies, you don't have those restrictions on investing in the cannabis space. And if you look at the legislative side of the state, we're about to enter into a, a legal cannabis environment, even though it had been medically legal for five years then, or something along those points. I think it was 09 in California, and this is about 2013. I'm now shopping around for real estate, and uh, everybody's telling me cannabis, cannabis, cannabis. And I, I just, I couldn't begin to get my head around it, but I had met some friends in the space a few years prior, and I thought, you know what? I know enough to know real estate, to know investment side, how to make money out of something. Let me just take take a few meetings with the, the cannabis guys and see where this goes. Um, and it turned out there was a huge need in the space for industrial warehouses. Uh, they couldn't get loans from banks. They, uh, landlords were barely interested in them. They were very willing to pay a multiple of what an existing a rental rate was. Say the, hypothetically, let's say the back in 2012, 2013, the industrial lease rate was, uh, let's say, $2 a foot in suburban Denver. These guys were willing to pay some of them upwards of $30 a foot for this space just because the business was so lucrative that they could fill a building with lights, air conditioning units, and plants and be able to sell it at the medical dispensaries, make much more than a profit. Um, and, and shower, rinse, repeat, scale that world as much as they could get access to capital to lease these warehouses and find sympathetic landlords. Uh, I stepped in with one of my real estate partners and we thought, okay, we can, we can figure this out. We can de-risk it ourselves. And like I said before, there's risk in everything. Um, but if, if you're able to contract around something and really figure it out and believe in yourself and double down you can, you can get there on just about anything. I knew nothing about cannabis. Um, I thought it'd be a quick way to make a buck and I didn't really believe in the plant, but I saw an economy there that was building burgeoning. And in 2013, when the laws passed, we were gonna have a adult use 21 plus cannabis market. And I thought there's, there's something there and the same guys that were beating me up on the, the big deals downtown and in the, the thriving suburbs couldn't participate in this space because they were traded on federal stock exchanges and had pension funds and whatnot as their investors. They were boxed out of this space, which was going to be extremely competitive and lucrative and little guys could get in with investors that, again, you knew their faces. They were willing to take the risk with their own money. They would understand that you had de-risked it enough and, and you were putting your own money in and thought it was viable. So we, we put together a small deal uh, with uh, myself, uh, two other partners, and they would be the operators. Myself and my real estate partner would go out and find a building, um, found a license. Nobody had ever been a, as, as Ian said in the intro, nobody had ever been a sheer wholesaler on the recreational side in Colorado. They had always been a storefront that ha had its own grow and sold their product from their own warehouse through their storefront. And that was the brand of, of the product they had was the name of the store. And they would just build more stores, again, constricted by capital, but build that model out. So we came in and thought, okay, if we do this, we need to be different. How can we be different? How can we get attention from a storefront owner now that the laws have changed and we are allowed to be just a wholesale manufacturer, cultivator, provider of, flour. Um, I have some, have some samples here, but I'm sorry, I can't, can't hand them out today. Um, we thought we can focus on quality. My guys, my, my operating partners said, we've never had a problem selling product. We do, we think we, we're, we grow the best. I, I'd learned that everybody says that, but we were able to tell in the, uh, some of the opening, um, kind of an Amazon of, of product and online dashboards where you were able to sell B2B cannabis from wholesalers to uh, storefronts, but they were mainly all storefronts that were selling to each other. It was just where the supply and demand was rebalancing in the state. So we came along with a 20, uh, at the time, a 12,000 square foot uh, warehouse with, I would say we probably had 10 to 20 employees as we slowly ramped in to this uh, 
180 lamp facility. Um, we were able to routinely sell out immediately. Um, oh, sorry, I, I, jumped, I jumped ahead a little bit. Um, sourcing the investors when it brought in the original cannabis deal was a no-go. Um, people didn't, even though they, they liked me, they liked the, the prospects of the business, all of that interest that was in real estate and whatnot had dried up and was nobody was going near a, a cannabis investment in, in 2013, 2014. Uh, they looked at me as if I had three heads and said, no, absolutely not. We needed, put together a business plan, needed about 500,000 to start up. Um, after my father had passed away, he left my mom with a small insurance policy, but she had a home that was paid for, uh, her own retirement pensions and whatnot for me, a teacher in Idaho and a few other, my father was a councilman and a few other um, retirement funds. Um, I, I went home to go round up some more money out of Sun Valley and invest in cannabis in some way, uh, the state of Colorado made that very difficult to get outside investors as well. So with all the headwinds facing us on the investment side, I asked, I told my mom I was thinking about getting into cannabis and they call it coming out green, um, that I was changing up pace from being a real estate executive to quasi venture capital, quasi founding a cannabis company, which is something I had never set out to do. Um, had to uh, tell her that. And she said, you know what? Um, she, my parents are old hippies. She said, I think that's wonderful. I think it's been a, a big problem that it's been criminalized throughout the world. Um, and she said, between you and me, your father in his final months had a little bit and, and it did help his suffering. And she said, I have this small life insurance check that disgusts me that it's a, a dollar figure attached to somebody's life and existence. And she said, I think he would really like it if you did something really for him with it. Um, and so I took that money and uh, as a loan and invested into my startup company uh, with, along with another investor, my old real estate partner. And we were able to launch um, a 12,000 square foot, 180 lamp facility with some grow partners. We staked them with the money and um, oversaw the legal, the accounting, the marketing, built a business around what they had as a really great product. Um, we've since been able to scale up that business. We are now um, branded as Veritas Fine Cannabis. We have this wonderful little packaging here that really helps uh, get, get our name throughout the state. We're probably in, uh, that was 2014, we signed our first lease. We are now in roughly 150 stores, um, 124 employees as of today. Uh, we sell about 1,500 pounds of product a month at the highest prices in Colorado, um, which is at times over $4,000 a pound. Um, so we're um, out selling low seven figures a month in cannabis. Uh, we now have 71,000 square feet under um, ownership ourselves. We were able to buy some of our properties, take on debt from private sources. We've brought um, through my real estate partner and myself, brought a, a corporate backbone to the cannabis space to, well, again, take these phenomenal growers um, and, and uh, brought along a brand building sales partner and, and built up a team to really take over the market um, in, in, a, in a positive way, bring a, a, a reputable kind of consumer friendly um, institutional stakeholder feel to a market that's really been underrepresented and, and underappreciated until now. Um, it, it seems that there is now all of a sudden legislation coming through. Uh, the Blue Wave in Georgia helped substantially for the prospects. Everything's a prospect until it's not. Um, we've been wondering how legalization is going to change our world ever since. Um, it, it is uh, always a challenge. Uh, there's, it's, it's a business where I, I'm trying to add regularity and almost boredom to it. I'm trying to take the excitement out of it uh, because there are so many uncontrollable variables. Um, my story, and I, I'll get to questions and answers in a second here, but I'm going to give answers that are very standard for any other entrepreneurial story of, you know, listen, trust in yourself, believe in yourself. I like the Andrew Carnegie quote of put all your eggs in one basket and watch that basket. That's what I did with that um, 
that check from my mom that we now have a, a, a company that, that means something to me and it makes me feel like I did something right. And it, it, um, it, it's much more than the money. The money's good. Uh, the money's not good for everybody. It is a very tough business. Um, when we started getting into the flower side, as I said, we're up to 1,500 pounds a month of, of product. We ship about, I have a few different brands here of these pre-roll joints. We've got eighth jars, we've got Mylar bags of eighths as well. Um, we, sh we ship about, or ship, uh, we sell 40,000 units a week, roughly. So we have our own little factory on hand. Um, as I said, we are top dollar in the Colorado market. Uh, we, we offer two brands, Cookies and Veritas. Uh, Cookies is owned by a rapper in Northern California named Burner. Um, he markets the product through Instagram, Spotify, and very different ways than our little company in Colorado ever could. Um, he builds a hype to the product and, and is able to sell out through very different uh, marketing channels because we're a very constricted industry. Uh, we can't go out and buy billboards, can't buy TV ads, can't buy radio, ad, or I guess there is radio ads. There are some caveats that if you can tell that um, a very high percentage, say 80 plus percent of your uh, viewership is 21 plus, it's an open avenue for you. Um, so we've had to get extremely creative on the marketing. It's a lot of uh, in-person events, product activations through that, through that channel. Um, so we, while they've taken a lot of tools away from us, it's added to the creativity necessary to thrive. And that is another, obviously, tool of entrepreneurialism that you're going to be told no. You're going to be shown roadblocks. You're going to be um, facing obstacles every which way, thousands of ways you, don't even, you haven't even considered yet. Um, much as I'm in an industry right now that wasn't an industry when I graduated UNH, I never thought it'd be living in Denver selling cannabis by the ton, um, that you know th things change. Um, while we've built up the flower side wonderfully, I've always thought that that's not my be all end all. And that's what I'm starting a new company now. I'm in a product launch 45 days from now, launching um, a Vare Skin. Uh, it's a department store-esque skincare made with THC, CBD. Um, our initial first three SKUs are a pain cream, a wound repair cream, and a uh, night cream that's a deep hydrator, um, also antibacterial um, formulated with a light lavender scent that helps your skin rehydrate, rehab, if you will, while you sleep. Um, I am partnered with a long time, 40 plus year uh, skin, organic skincare formulator from companies like Procter & Gamble, Shiseido, L'Oreal. Uh, I'm also partnered with a world-class chief scientific officer with multiple doctorates from University of Minnesota, University of Wyoming, and uh, she's a professor at University of Wyoming. Um, she has Department of Defense grants, National Institute of Health grants, and has turned that knowledge and know-how onto cannabinoids for us. We are able to test our products in her laboratory on human cadaver skin. So we are able to actually bring scientific efficacy to the cannabinoid space, to, to cannabis, to hemp, uh, where my previous company was based around happiness, Avera will be based around healing and health. Uh, we were able to show through um, up to 630X microscopes, which actually just show molecules and almost a Northern Lights look of a wound healing occurring at a ephemeral level, if you will. Um, we were, we were able, to, able to show the molecules speaking to each other before they actually turn into physical attachments to each other and create the healing. Um, the skin and, and a lot of germs, um, antimicrobials, antibacterials, have never, been, have never faced cannabinoids and their antimicrobial properties. So all the, uh, a lot of the resistances that are in the, the chemistry now of drug resistance and antibiotic resistance, that sort of thing, uh, these bad actors, bad agents um, are impervious to cannabinoids because they haven't um, a, attack, been attacked by them. Uh, that, that won't last forever, obviously, but, um, but as, it, as it is now, we're launching these three SKUs um, in mid-April in Colorado dispensaries. They do have THC in. They are very high strength um, and uh, looking forward to changing, again, both the face of the industry and, and bringing true scientific help and healing um, to, the, to the world, if you will, um, through cannabinoids um, and 
taking away some of the stigma of an industry that I, I faced as an entrepreneur in the earlier days. Um, some of my partners had been in the business since, uh, well, let's just say they were ready for legalization. Um, and uh, it's, it's a shame that it's been such a stigmatized plant. Uh, there's a old Ralph Waldo Emerson quote that I like that says, a, a weed is just a, a plant the world hasn't found a use for yet. And I, I, every day I just start to feel that we're getting more and more closer to a, a bona fide use for it. There are medical properties to this. Uh, we have the scientific proof. We're going to be bringing it out to the world in, in very short order and uh, look forward to being a, a positive feature um, in, in the space and in the, in the greater in entrepreneurial community. Um, Ian, anything I missed? I'm a blabber. Oh my gosh, it's uh, amazing. I, um, you know, one of the things I love, and I know we met in Colorado like three years ago, <clears throat> and one of the things that always struck me is that your entrepreneurial journey is in, in many ways very personal. And you know, talking about your your dad and your mom again, <clears throat> and I think you know, for a lot of the students here who are on, like a lot of innovation and problem solving comes from some personal experience or personal drive, and 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 listen to that. Um, <clears throat> the other thing, that, speaking of listening, that I, you know, I, I jotted down because both Jerome and you said it, you know, which was, you know, shut up and listen, you know, and for you, you didn't know you were supposed to listen, but when everybody kept asking you about investing in cannabis real estate, you know, your customer, it's actually a very simple process. Your customer actually tells you where you need to go. And, and we always can check our egos and not know, be the know-it-all and listen to that. It, it's actually a relatively simple formula. Execution is hard, agreed, and both of you have shared how the execution part um, has been brutal and, and the headwinds across the board of that. Um, so that's great. And then also the fact that um, believe in yourself. You know, again, that's the same almost word for word that Jerome said. And, and in the dark days of, of being an entrepreneur, you have to believe in yourself. So um, I just want to sort of tie some of those themes together. So um, thank you for that. I'm, a, I'm um, a control freak and a planner, and I never could have planned this in a million years. <laughs> Um, just as a side note, for those of you who have not, just drop in your uh, user ID in chat for I2 Passport um, <clears throat> and, and drop any additional questions you have. Um, you know, one of the things so we, know, we talked a, like a month or so ago in, in sort of prep for this. Um, so to the extent you can talk more about the wrapper piece, like when you told me that story and that cause and effect, like it was just, I was blown away. Like I just, I, I still actually can't let go of that as a marketing thing. So to the extent you can share whatever portion of that story um, publicly and, and it could be recorded. So um, I just thought it's a really cool insight for, for people to hear the creative marketing and that you did for that. Yeah, um, so, you know, like I said, we're primarily, we're Veritas. Um, we are just a, a five person ownership group uh, based in Denver and had a little Instagram page, had some following with some, you know, we, we even though Colorado is five and a half million people, it's a, it's a very large market for cannabis. We did 2.2 billion in sales last year through 621 plus recreational dispensaries. Um, so we're able to make some noise and obviously make a living for our, our customers, our, I mean, our, our employees, our stakeholders and, and what have you. Um, and, and that's wonderful. At the end of the day, that's enough. That's, that's the dream. Um, we brought on a, another brand from California called Cookies. Uh, we are the, um, in, we came to the market uh, last April, mid pandemic. Um, Cookies is a, a wrapper owned um, flower brand from out of San Francisco slash Oakland um, that it is pretty much the pulse of a, a very different clientele than, than what we had. Um, been selling to in Colorado as the, the luxury flower purveyor. Um, everything we do is very artisanal. It's very, very much by hand, even though we are taking down these very large warehouses, uh, we have them filled with people that are gardening and, and tending to these plants in a very bespoke way that a lot of people, um, and a lot of our competition is doing things fully automated. There's nothing wrong with that. It's just a different kind of space in the retail hierarchy, if you will. Um, there's, it's a lot like the beer space. There are wonderful, expensive craft brewers. There's the, the Molson Coors, AB InBev brands. Then there's even, you know, the, the lower brands from there. So, and it's the same thing with cannabis. 
Um, when we brought on the cookies brand, that came with a marketing apparatus that was like nothing we had ever seen. Uh, we were doing things like meet the growers events at dispensaries and bringing uh, team members in in person to talk about to talk to the customers about uh, different nutrients we use or different styles or techniques and and um, appealing to them from the artisanal level of uh, there are a lot of home growers in Colorado. We are legally allowed to have six plants per person in a locked room in your house. Uh, so there are, there are a lot of people testing it out um, and kind of geeking out as, as to the process and not being able to match the quality we were ever at. And while we're offering at the time, probably 40 strains. Um, so, so we did things very mom and pop on, on a large level. Um, we were at that point, we were at 24,000 square feet um, between 400 and 450 lamps. Um, and, and again, putting out a living, um, about to take down another 40,000 square foot warehouse that was just gonna do the same thing. We were approached by a, a, one of the multinational uh, cannabis operators who was representing a relationship with the wrapper burner and his brand cookies, uh, which did came, come with a few other um, tangential relationships to other hip hop rap stars like Rick Ross, um, who uh, run the jewels um, and a few other, um, obviously big inroads into the hip hop community, athletic community, that sort of thing. That was all um, digitally cemented together through millions of Instagram followers, uh, millions of Spotify listeners, uh, he's able to rap about specific strains that we have, and then that strain will sell out once his single hits Spotify. Um, we saw that last year uh, with uh, Run the Jewels released a, a product with uh, one of their co-brands here that we now have the strain in-house called Ooh La La, named after one of their singles off their new album. Then you have uh, the head of Run the Jewels, uh, Killer Mike, out talking about on the talk show circuits and what what have you talking about his his flower brand and building the hype like that um and and at the end of the day selling product um making sure that their brand and their goods uh, and the quality is everything that lives up to um what their fans expect out of their hip-hop uh strengths so uh this isn't a by any means a, a branding play or, or licensing putting a name on some garbage product these guys really do deliver the goods at the end of the day, because you'll, you'll hear about it over and over again. You'll see it populate on the shelves. You'll see the lines out the door of the dispensaries Friday morning when we make the drops. Um, and, and you see people waiting for this new strain or new hotness, as they say. And it rarely ever lives up to the hype with somebody putting their name on it or, or what have you. And this actually does. The, this um, the, the most hardcore growers and connoisseurs in my Toby, we lost uh, sound for you. Back? Yep, yep. Good, okay. Everybody yep. takes pride in their own genetics, their own process, their, no, now it's saying I have unstable internet. Um, we good? Yeah, it's good. So just one thing too, just echoing that <clears throat> to the extent, um, I think you're telling me the story that, you know, a rapper dropped the song on a weekend and by Friday, they've just mentioned in passing the name of the new product. And that is what caused the line around the block to sell. It just, it's just amazing that cause and effect uh, for you. So, um, so we're almost at time for questions, but there's one here that said from Matt, um, if federal legalization, legalization happened tomorrow, how would Veritas's strategy shift? So it, there's um, federal legalization is a big word that it's a big gray area. There's a whole lot of levels that I've been nuanced to. Um, the, when we talk about the first steps of it, whether that's the SAFE Act or the States Act, that would open up banking, uh, that would open up the stock exchange, that would be a game changer. Uh, the next, one of the next phases that people really think about with federal legalization is interstate commerce. Uh, being able to manufacture a product in one state, ship it to a sales force or a, a storefront in another state. Uh, that is not legal at this juncture, uh, even if the states are touching, if it's Washington, Oregon, California, even BC and Alaska, that whole West Coast is 21 plus legal. You cannot, ship, you cannot 
take it across borders. So if we're talking about federal legalization in the, in the sense of interstate commerce, uh, we would be doubling down on Colorado facilities um, and, and building up larger presence here to service the, the Midwest um, and then focus on another plant in probably California, maybe Nevada, Arizona, um, and then somewhere back east as well. Um, that said, we're, we're looking at into future states. We are doing a capital raise um, in the coming months and are going to be making first out of state expansion shortly. So that's our strategy now. Will it change if federal legalization happens tomorrow? The landing site of our next um, expansion could change um, just because I don't know where it is yet. Um, but that, that said, we, we would like to be geographically dispersed with maybe five kind of plants. Um, in some ways we're very similar to the dairy business that you don't want to ship milk across the country because you lose a week of its expiration date. It's the same with our crops. Great. <clears throat> so we're at uh, time. So for some of the others, if you want to hang on later, um, there's probably an opportunity to do that. <clears throat> so two things. Um, first, before we do the drawing, uh, and for those of you who have done this before, if everybody could come off mute for me, please. Um, and, and join me in you thanking mean. both Jerome and Toby for just a really really interesting very different journeys and yet there are a lot of similarities in it so if everybody could just uh join me in a round of applause uh with volume up thank you very much for that um okay so a uh, couple of things just as a wrap up we're going to do the two raffle drawings for hayden sports so uh, again what we do is as you registered uh, on eventbrite your name is associated with a number uh, right now, the numbers with some who have left or didn't show up is between 1 and 37. So, uh, Jerome, since you went first, if you could just pick a number between 1 and 37 and whoever's name is associated with that will win. It has to be the number 6. Okay. Shocker. <laughs> there we go. Number, number 6 is Brooke Samara. Samara. Yep. Brooke, are you on? Awesome, thank you. Great, fantastic. You're welcome. Uh, Toby, for you, so one in 37, but not six. Go 33, Larry Bird. 33 is Spencer Coveney. Nice job, Spencer. Awesome. Thank you very much. So thank you all again for attending. I like to do always end these uh, on time or just a little bit before, uh, just out of respect. So I know you guys do Zoom. Uh, more often and we all do zoom more often than we want so i appreciate you hanging on for an hour and a half but um you know it's, it's just it, to me they're fascinating journeys um and look forward to your next engagement with us if anyone wants to hang on if, if jerome and toby you have a couple minutes uh to hang on if anyone wants to hang on uh, or not going to, to class feel free to do it and you can ask some additional questions so otherwise thank you very much and we'll see you at our next event